Okay, so let's get started. We have a wonderful list of presenters today. Uh, good evening and welcome. My name is Dr. Cassandra Hansen. I'm the Interim Program Director of GIS and Environmental Sciences and Policy at Johns Hopkins University Advanced Academic Program. This, this presentation is being recorded and it will be available in our JHU GIS YouTube channel um, once it's processed. So before we get started, I'm always curious to see where in the world our attendees are coming from. So if you don't mind just putting in the chat window your geographic location, that would be fantastic. So we can officially greet you. So where are you joining us from tonight? All right, Canada, excellent. Boston, excellent, excellent. Great to see you guys. Maryland, fabulous. Well, welcome everyone. California, Arcata, Washington, DC. So it's so nice to see everyone here and the geospatial aspect of, of our audience. So for tonight, um, if you have any questions, feel free to, or questions or comments, feel free to use the chat. Um, we will be pausing after each presentation to answer those questions um, Q&A. You're more than welcome to, again, put those questions in Q&A and I will give voice to them. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with our GIS program here at Johns Hopkins, we're a fully online flex, flex, flexible map flexible, sorry about that, master's program. And we also offer an online flexible GIS certification program as well. And so tonight you're going to be hearing from students, Hopkins students and alumni that are going to be sharing with us their work. Um, some of their work is what they're doing right now in the field, or some of it is part of their capstone thesis. So it's really exciting to see the scope of Hopkins students. So again, we designed this speaker series to really highlight the amazing work that the industry GIS professionals are doing, uh, Hopkins students and alumni, um, and, and what latest and greatest technology that they're using in the field. So I'm always curious on, again, where you're joining us from. So thank you for pro providing that information. But also I'm curious on the, the background of our audience. So we're going to go ahead and launch two polls. And the first one is going to be focused on who are you? Are you the general public? Are you a Hopkins student? Are you faculty, alumni, or a GIS professional? So if you could go ahead and put in your answers to that poll, that would be fabulous. I'll give you about five seconds to participate in that poll. And then we're going to go ahead and launch a second poll. And the second poll is really focused on what is your background knowledge of GIS? Is this the first time you're hearing about GIS? Um, is this is this something that you work and, and use on a day-to-day -day basis, or is this a brand new field for you? So looking at the results of it, who's in our audience today, we have 24% of our general public. We have 71% of our students. So nice to see the students here. We have 6% faculty. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for those answers. And then let's get an idea of, of your background. So you're coming to us um, with the common knowledge, no knowledge, some knowledge, or you use GIS on a day-to-day -day basis. So go ahead and put your answers in for the poll and we'll, we'll get moving along. All right, get those answers in and let's close that poll and see uh, who we have with us here. So great, so we do have some folks that GIS is new to them, which is fabulous. There's 22% that has some knowledge. Uh, we have 44% that is currently learning about GIS and 17% who are using GIS. So this is terrific. So let's go ahead and let's start GIS After Dark. So for those of you who are not familiar with GIS, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. And the, the, pro, the practice of GIS allows for the creation and collection of geospatial information in simple maps and apps. And representing what is known is the overall goal for any GIS professional through the use of data collection, analysis, map creation, and apps. So we're always wanting to know about the what, the when, the where, and the hows of our geospatial world. So we've seen how GIS has been leveraged as a powerful data visualization and analysis tool for making decisions based on science and facts that have real world consequences. And we've been seeing this over the last two years. Probably one of the best example that shows the power of the spatial reach of GIS is the Johns Hopkins COVID dashboard. Also, in the last few weeks, we've seen and observed the usefulness of GIS that is being used to capture and share the devastating information that's unfolding from the floods in Pakistan to the devastation caused by um, Hurricane Ian. So just some examples. So our students are always working on 
creating beautiful maps, working on analysis. And so one of our JHU students uh, was featured, and I want to highlight um, her work. She was most recently featured in the Esri plenary um, in July. So it's the Esri, Esri Users Conference, the big GIS Users Conference. Um, so congratulations, Emily Long. So sh her gender gap in STEM uh, map, which was produced as a final project in our cartography class, was presented on the center, center stage with uh, Jack Dangerman. So congratulations, Emily, on your work. So tonight, we're also going to hear from other JHU projects um, and students, featuring students that are doing work from all around the world. So this leads me to tonight's presenters, which are all either Hopkins alumni or currently finishing out their degree. So let's look at the students that are in the spotlight tonight. So again, I am so pleased and honored to welcome Owen, Mackenzie, Diana, and Chris, um, each one presenting a unique perspective on GIS and geointelligence, as well as providing uh, tips and tricks on how to make good maps and how to make maps for good and to save the world. So again, if you have any questions um, regarding the presentations um, in tonight's lineup, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat, and I'm more than happy after each presentation we can I can ask those questions for the presenters. Presenters can also answer their own questions if they're not presenting um, in the chat window. So let's go ahead, uh, before we get started, let's just give all the presenters a round of applause. Thank you guys for all being here tonight. Um, our first presenter, Owen Legrone, is coming to us and he's gonna be sharing with us his work on the rise of Turkey's Baker Technologies, which was a published uh, thesis that he will be sharing with us tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my sharing power, and I'm gonna turn it over to Owen. Thank you, Owen, for being here. Hello. Um, thank you for having me um, tonight. So um, as, as you said already, um, I will be discussing my recent thesis in geospatial intelligence at Johns Hopkins. This is not a purely GIS project, um, it's, it's part of the geospatial intelligence program here at, at Johns Hopkins. And so it'll be a less GIS focused than the other three presentations that you'll see, but I hope that you um, will learn a few things from it about the geospatial intelligence process. Um, so what is geospatial intelligence? Some of you already know, especially the current students here. Um, and certainly, if you take classes in that field, you'll get a lot of different definitions of what geospatial intelligence is. Um, in, very succinctly, it is the practice of extracting useful intelligence from geospatial data of different kinds. Um, that often takes the form of satellite imagery, but it can also take the form of many other kinds of geospatial data, including other kinds that are often stored within a GIS. And I did use GIS to do a lot of the analysis and processing for this project, even if the final results were not necessarily um, GIS focused. Uh, geospatial intelligence is often thought of as a cycle. There are some things wrong with that conceptual view, um, but as a basic model, um, that's how I've chosen to organize this presentation because uh, I, I took the cycle from the planning stage initially um, to the production stage in which I produced my, my final product. Um, uh, in this case, that was through the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Terraline program. Um, and so I'll show you how I did it and, and what I did along the way. So the idea for the, my project um, came from the, the currency of Baikar Technologies, this Turkish drone manufacturer um, in the news today. I've been following Baikar for a few years. Um, they came to prominence in 2020 after um, the war in Nagorno-Karabakh where they were credited with a major role. Um, and although there's a lot of discussion about Baikar in the Western news media, You've probably heard the word Bayraktar before if you followed events in Ukraine. Um, there's very little about the nuts and bolts of this company and how they came to dominate the Turkish drone industry and how Turkey in turn came to become such a prominent drone power in the world. Um, that's what I wanted to explore. 
and I wanted to pursue a multidisciplinary approach as well to exploring it. There's a lot to be learned from satellite imagery, um, but uh, among the other things that I've, I've learned here at Johns Hopkins is the value of open source intelligence, the extraction of geospatial information from non-traditional sources, including uh, media sources, uh, social media sources, um, and um, a variety of other places as well. All things that your average person can go to and find usually on the internet and then put together to produce actual intelligence. It, it wasn't immediately clear to me how I would organize this, but um, eventually I decided to organize it in two parts, one focusing on physical infrastructure of this company, which is large and covers a lot of Turkey. Um, and the, the second part, which covers major operations undertaken by the company. You'll see that the first part was very heavy in imagery analysis. So the very traditional nuts and bolts of geospatial intelligence. And the second part um, leaned much more into non-traditional sources, including a lot of social media sources, which I crunched together. So um, let's just take a brief look at collection. My biggest source for collection was um, GEGD, which is a special uh, platform offered by Maxar to certain government customers. I got access to this because I used the NGA's Terraline program for my project. I'll discuss that later. But GEGD essentially is just um, a, a provider, a, a way to access Maxar imagery from different satellites like Worldview satellites and uh, the GOI series. Um, it's probably probably the premier um, company for high resolution commercially available satellite imagery. And most of the imagery I used came from here. However, I did use um, a lot of other sources too. Um, I use Sentinel Hub for some of my medium or low resolution satellite imagery needs. Um, it's very useful, uh, especially the revisit rate for many parts of the world is very high compared to Maxar. Um, and for cases where I wasn't able to get more current imagery from Maxar, I was usually able to get it from Sentinel. So that was very good to have. Um, I use Google Earth, uh, as you might imagine, together with Image Hunter, which is a private website that allows you to look up for a certain geographical area the satellites that have overflown that area and the imagery they've provided at specific times. So if you have a Google Earth image and you know the date from Google Earth's historical function, you can look back in time and see which satellite actually took this picture that went into Google Earth, when it took it, um, and grab the metadata for that image. So, um, and now go, moving to the open source, side of the collection, I really tried to use as many open sources as I possibly could. But you can see that some of them turned out to be more usable than others to me. Um, YouTube <laughs> really took the cake for um, benefiting my analysis here. And Twitter was, was a close second. And that was mainly due to the very aggressive self-promotion efforts of Bicar Technologies. They put a lot of stuff on YouTube, even in their very early days when they were just a, a startup in Istanbul and they were very little known, they were putting stuff on YouTube. And so um, I was able to go back and gather, collect and aggregate a lot of that early data um, it, to chronicle how they developed as a company. Um, Twitter was, was mainly a result of the public presence of um, by Care Technologies Chief Technology Officer, Haluk Baraktar, and it's, uh, um, or sorry, the CEO, Haluk Baraktar, and the Chief Technology Officer, uh, Selçuk Baraktar, um, who both are profligate posters on Twitter and often reveal a lot of information about their company's operations on Twitter. So um, besides that, media helped me a lot. Turkish local media reports heavily on this. Um, because it's a topic of interest for many people in Turkey who are interested in defense and foreign policy. Um, and the, uh, the last major thing that helped me was the archived versions of my car's corporate website. Uh, they had a website very early. Uh, it was set up in 2003, back when they were still ostensibly 
an auto parts company with five employees. And so that gives me a long-standing, almost 20 year record from which I can draw to support other parts of my analysis. So um, how did I put all this stuff together? There were a couple of different ways. The biggest component of my combined analysis was pretty low tech. I made a big Excel spreadsheet and I used it to compare my observations from different sources, essentially in one place. You can see I, I grabbed a screenshot from one of my observation tracking spreadsheets. This shows a lot of the satellite images I used and how I compared them um, and what I was looking at at the time. Um, I could show you other screenshots that show satellite images and social media sources and georeference videos also compared side by side. I, I put them all into a, a similar format so that I could directly see um, uh, in a chronological form what was happening at specific sites. And often I was able to fill in the gaps between satellite images using georeference social media imagery and and other open source stuff um, to see what was happening at the particular site between overflights. Um, that was very useful. I archived a lot of stuff. I highly recommend that. Anyone else performing open source um, geospatial intelligence work? Uh, I used a couple different publicly available websites to archive all my stuff. Um, and that ensures that it's available in perpetuity online, whether by car decides to take it down or move it or, or change it or, or whatever. And also when you're going to the Terraline program later, it allows you to create stable links so that people can always uh, be able to click on um, links to material you've saved and then see what was in there. Um, I made a big placemark file on Google Earth. That was a big part of it as well. Um, one, of the, one of the truly GIS focused parts of this. Although I did use GIS to make maps as well, that's less emphasized in this presentation. And then of course I took a lot of notes. Um, yeah, profuse note taking definitely helped me in this project. So now we get to the processing stage. That's sort of the part of the intelligence cycle where um, after we've collected all this raw information, we start turning it into um, exploitable information, useful stuff that we can compare. So I already mentioned archiving. Um, most of this had to be translated because it is mostly in Turkish. Um, I tried not to use English language sources for the most part where I possibly could uh, to get the most authentic um, material possible. I just use machine translation for the vast majority of it. I have a, a few Turkish friends where I work here also who helped me out quite a bit with this. Um, geolocation is another fun part of geospatial intelligence. I highly recommend for the current students who are interested in this, um, Professor uh, Kivimakis. Um, social media intelligence class certainly taught me a lot about geolocating stuff. This is a super basic example, what you see on the screen here, um, just taking a satellite image and an image from social media, um, finding reference points, and then adding coordinates to that image based on those reference points. I did that uh, a lot for a lot of different photos and a lot of different videos, sometimes more success than others, but um, for the successful times, um, like I said, it helped me fill in the gaps when satellite imagery was not available. So finally, we have our finished product. So I not only did my thesis through Johns Hopkins, but I also applied through um, a special program, a public um, facing website created by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency called Tierline. And anyone can get work on Tierline theoretically, uh, but Johns Hopkins has a special partnership with Tierline. And there's an application process to have your project be hosted there. Um, you have to prove that it's, it's, it's useful um, to them, that they're interested in it, that it, it covers one of the areas of subject matter that they're most concerned with. I actually didn't think that mine would cover one of those topics at, at, at first because um, Turkey is not one of the focuses of the agency, but um, it was of interest, I, I suppose, just because of the applications, the specific applications of geospatial intelligence techniques, and they decided to take it. So, um, you know, Chris and, and anyone else doing this program, um, I highly recommend applying to Terline. It's very useful. They 
they they help you actively as you're doing it by giving you editing support. There is a liaison with NGA that you have um, who will give you feedback on your paper and will definitely make your paper better. Um, in my case, really, I had to turn it from an academic paper into interactive web content, which took a lot of time and, and a lot of effort. I It's about one month ago, actually, that my project went up on here. Um, and that was a, it was at this time that I decided to divide it into two parts, just because of the amount of content and um, the logical split between the two topics that I was trying to discuss. A lot goes into Turline. There's the text itself. There's um, a lot of annotated imagery that goes in there, most of which I made in, in PowerPoint and later turned into PNGs and moved online. Um, there's a lot of extra files that go in there. Um, most of what I had in um, uh, annexes um, later in my paper turned into tables, which were turned into separate files, which now people can download from Terraline as files if they're interested in how I reached a specific conclusion from my research. And of course, I attached geospatial data too. There's a little map window within um, each tier line piece where you can add points on a map relating to your topic. It's not the most advanced interface, to be honest, but you can add more um, in the form of separate files that you, people can download if you need to. And that's, that's what I did as well. So um, I'll, I'll conclude by just giving a little bit about the content of my report and, and what I did with it, kind of what it looks like. Again, the link is online. If you just look up by car technologies, tear line, you can, you can see more about what I actually ended up doing. But for part one, I focus primarily on facilities. There, there are three of these. Um, by car since 2014 has developed a very large factory complex um, in the Western outskirts of Istanbul to produce its products. And it also has acquired two testing facilities, um, which serve a combined testing and training role. Bicar is very vertically integrated, and they do a lot of their um, testing and uh, crew training all in-house, um, which I thought was an interesting, interesting insight um, from, from my analysis. Um, I was able to, just from imagery alone, just from looking at satellite imagery, as you can see here, make a lot of conclusions about how these sites have changed because things like an airfield and a factory inevitably have a big geospatial footprint. And so I was able to quantify um, how the amount of hangar space grew with these facilities. I was able to quantify how the production floor space grew. Um, I was able to quantify how other facilities um, and infrastructure, including communications, uh, antennas, and roads and parking lots and garages and administrative buildings um, all grew during this time and, and often exponentially so. It's what I would expect considering the growth of the company itself. But I was also to make a few specific recommendations on where certain operations were likely to happen next. There, there was an element of estimative prediction um, included in my report. Um, and I'll actually be interested to see whether some of the predictions I made come true, but I, I won't dwell on them. Um, and of course, they're all accompanied by a certain probability. Um, certainly nothing is certain in geospatial intelligence. So finally, um, the operations section dwells on what Bicar Technologies does with these facilities, from production to flight testing, training, and then finally, delivery of products to customers. I was able to pin locations to all of those activities, and I was also able to quantify a lot of the activities. This is where the social media intelligence and other research that I did really came in handy because I was able to assemble statistical tables of things that you know were not previously published, like deliveries of drones, for example. All right, often local media picks up on a delivery of drones to a particular customer, like the Turkey Air Force. Um, but it doesn't really appear anywhere else, right? The company doesn't publicize it. They especially stopped publicizing deliveries after 2019 um, when the United Nations criticized them for delivering drones to Libya in violation of, of the UN embargo on that country. Um, and so it became especially hard after that, but I was still able to collate a lot of data about deliveries and get a much better look about how production has expanded over the years. A lot of social media sources 
um, really helped with that. I quantified other things too, like um, even, even the um, average number of employees at the company, I was able to quantify and put in a separate spreadsheet that lent some credence to other insights I made here. So um, you can see it's very number heavy, but uh, my conclusion from this part was the same as the first part, which is that operations of all kinds have really expanded dramatically. And it, it's what you would expect to see for a company emerging as one of the predominant combat drone manufacturers in the world um, from 2014 to the present in only eight years really, it's, it's attained this status um, and is something definitely worth analyzing um, as a geospatial intelligence project. So with that, I might have taken over my time. Um, I will I will cede the, the floor back to Cassie. Thank you, Owen. That was great. Um, very interesting topic. And what a great example of culminating uh, geospatial information from so many different resources um, to be able to, you know, form a question and then test that hypothesis. So that's fabulous. Um, a question that came through um, from David is, are you able to summarize the main subjects Terraline typically focuses on? Um, are you able to speak to that? Owen. The main subjects that Terraline focuses on. Um, the main subjects that Terraline focuses on are generally the main subjects I feel that the NGA probably focuses on, although I don't have any insider information about the NGA's priorities. Um, North Korea is a priority. Um, China is a priority. Russia is a priority. In other countries that are considered strategic adversaries of the United States are a priority. Um, and then there's also a certain priority set on environmental and public health crises, as well as sort of non-state threats that the NGA keeps track of. Um, so mine were actually filed under the category, I believe, of emerging technologies, I wanna say, without, without having it in front of me. There's te technology, general technology related um, coverage. And I think I got thrown in there along with someone who did a report on um, on um, GPS technology. So, Excellent. yeah. Thank you, thank you. And um, if if by any chance you have the link to your paper, if it's open source and you have it available, I know the folks attending tonight would love it if you could throw it in the chat window. Um, but thank you, Owen, for attending. And um, I know it's late for you, so thank you for being here. And um, and everyone, let's give Owen a round of applause. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Also, I want to say the Wayback. I'm so glad that you mentioned the Wayback resource as uh, something that you used in your research. I tend to use the Wayback, Wayback um, URL for many different projects when you're trying to look for archived information um, on the internet. All, All right. right. So th there's my there's my report. It's right there in the comments. Perfect. Um, so. Thank you, Owen. That's great. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna focus on GIS for the good of the order, uh, creating GIS maps, supporting GIS initiatives um, for helping in disaster response. And so we have tonight's presenter, Mackenzie Fox, who is an environmental science and policy alumni, but she also was a dual GIS major. So Mackenzie, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Cassie. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mackenzie Fox. I'm here to share a bit about my volunteer work with um, GIS Core. As Cassie said, I graduated from Hopkins in 2021 with a master's in environmental science and policy, and I completed the certificate in GIS. Currently work for US Fish and Wildlife in their branch of geospatial data services based out of Lakewood, Colorado. Um, I began volunteering with GIS Core a little bit after I graduated in 2021 with um, working on Hurricane Ida as my first project with them. As a quick background about GIS Core, their mission is to bring GIS services to underserved communities worldwide. They offer assistance to organizations in data collection and management, application development, training and consulting, and situational awareness during natural disasters. 
So I currently serve as a admin for the GIS Core Photo Mappers group. Um, photo Mapper services are typically requested most often during hurricanes, but we've also responded to several tornado events as well. Um, typically, it will start with FEMA requesting photo mappers. And at that point, admins and volunteers begin searching Twitter, Facebook, news articles, any other online information sources for photographic or video damage from the disaster. Um, as Owen alluded to, we do a lot of geolocating based on these photos, looking at uh, clues within the image, uh, text comments, and generally I use Google um, Street View to verify those locations. So this video um, is showing our workflow, and this is during Hurricane Ian just recently. Um, so the workflow uses ArcGIS Online, Survey123, and ArcGIS Experience Builder. Um, so this is a view of one of the photo maps. But basically, we start here within this Google Sheets view, um, link to the, for example, this is a Twitter article. Um, and save the image. Um, And then I would verify this again in Google Street View. Um, I skipped that part for the purpose of this demonstration. Uh, so you can basically just drag and drop that image into this form, which is embedded in Experience Builder is the Survey123 form. And in this case, I would search Charleston, South Carolina. You could enter your coordinates. You can enter an address. Um, in this scenario, I'd be locating this kind of cross streets that's flooded. So after dropping a pin on the map, we specify is it city town level exact location, um, other details about the photo, give it a title description. And uh, then we can assign it up to three categories. This one is like uh, roads and highways flooding on a road. And that helps uh, on the admin side of things, which is this view. Um, so basically when a volunteer submits a photo, um, it's categorized as unvetted, and then it's the admin's responsibility to verify the data and assign a community lifeline, as well as a damage score. Admins can go in here and change the geometry if they need to, um, or any of the data. And then again, the most important part is assigning that lifeline and damage score, which helps on the emergency manager side for them prioritizing where to send those resources. And just as a little zoom around the map, um, this is looking at Daytona Beach. There is some, as I'm sure you all heard, pretty incredible flooding there. Um, and yeah, we were very busy doing this for about five days straight. So um, this is the public view of the dashboard. This is what emergency managers would see. Um, so basically this is the community lifeline view and then they can also view the photos categorized by the damage scores. Another project I've worked on recently with GIS Core is a creation of a survey for water quality data. This was a student-led citizen science project with the Ward Melville Heritage Organization. And this organization is a nonprofit which owns a large wetland preserve called West Meadow Creek in the Long Island Sound. Along with building the survey, I also helped with some of the backend data management in ArcGIS Online, uh, training staff in navigating Esri platforms, 
as well as help to make a story map uh, showcasing the project and the results. So here's some screenshots from the survey in Survey123 web app. It allows users, again, to drop a pin on the map at their location, um, or they can select uh, one of the pre-entered data collection sites, which is tied to another Excel sheet with lat longs. Um, entering water quality data, and then any species observations that they had at that particular point or data collection site. This is the back end of Survey123 Connect, um, which is created out of an XLS form. Uh, Connect is really great because it gives you a lot more flexibility than using Survey123 in the web app. You can create related tables, um, enter a choice filter, uh, enter calculations, et cetera. So I use this um, to create nested repeats. So basically at one point, um, one survey entry, you can link multiple species observations and that would create a related table in RGS Online. So onto the story map that we created, uh, basically has the overview of West Meadow Creek, the project, a history of the conservation center there, and a lot of photos of the students collecting data and having a good time out in the field. I also included a map tour, uh, which scrolls through each of the collection sites and is linked to the data and will show any images that are associated with that site. And lastly, I added a data dashboard into the story map just to kind of summarize the results of the student data collection. In this survey, students focus mostly on uh, dissolved oxygen levels at the sites across the Long Island Sound. So I include a pie chart kind of emphasizing that, um, as well as viewers can click on the points on the map to view attribute data or scroll through on this right-hand pane. So that pretty much summarizes those two projects with GIS Core. Um, I've done a couple other ones relating to COVID uh, testing sites and they're a really great organization. It's been uh, a wonderful way to kind of get my foot in the door and get a lot of like real world GIS experience, um, improve my skills with some of the software and help out on some really cool projects. So I'd highly recommend reaching out um, if you're interested in volunteering or you wanna ask me any questions, I'm happy to answer them here or offline. And I can um, provide these links in the chat as well. Thank you, Mackenzie. That was terrific. Thanks, nice everybody. job. Nice job. And thank you so much for your volunteer work. Um, you've been doing this for two years, you said, about two years? Uh, a little bit. 2021, I started. So yeah, like a year and a half or so. And then you just received an award or a, 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 a an nomination for a volu outstanding volunteer from GIS Corps, uh, highlighting your work. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah they yeah. featured me in their newsletter. Um, yeah, recently, so that was terrific. Nice. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Um, for, for, for those that are listening that really want that real world application, um, I cannot uh, recommend this organization enough. Um, it is so wonderful and it talk about the sense of community and the sense of really everyone jumping in, rolling their sleeves up, pulling all nighters as much time as you can. But sometimes you do pull all nighters <laughs> if you if you can um, to really help for the good of the order. So Mackenzie, thank you, thank you so much for sharing with us your your amazing work. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. So with that said, so if there's any questions that um, you have for Mackenzie, uh, feel free to post them in the Q and A or post them in the chat, and we can get back to you. Um, or if anyone has a question right now, I'll pause for a brief moment while Diana gets her slides ready to go. Um, so any questions for Mackenzie? 
I see there's some nice uh, virtual applause emojis coming in the chat window. So I think we'll go ahead and move forward. And again, feel free to, to ask those questions in the chat window. Okay, so next we have Diana Gerberich that's gonna be sharing with us her um, GIS capstone project that she finished last spring, um, focusing on air pollution and looking at how that's related to type two diabetes. So Diana, thank you so much for sharing with us your work. Yeah, um, thank you everyone for, um, for listening in. Very excited to be here. Um, as, as mentioned, I completed my uh, master's in, in GIS uh, this past spring, um, and I'll be presenting my capstone project. Uh, my capstone project is looking at the correlation between air pollution um, and type 2 diabetes. Uh, so the research question for my capstone project uh, was, are there spatial and space-time correlations between air pollution PM 2.5 concentrations and type 2 diabetes prevalence in the United States? So to simplify that, I wanted to look at the correlation between air pollution and diabetes. Now, a little bit of background on this, um, this problem and this relationship. Um, so air pollution um, is considered to be one of the greatest threats to human health, according to the World Health Organization. Um, about 4.2 million deaths globally can be attributed to ambient air pollution, and 100,000 of those deaths are in the United States. Um, so this is definitely an issue that affects um, the population all around the world. And I specifically focused on a type of air pollution called particulate matter 2.5 or abbreviated to PM 2.5. And what that means is air pollution that has um, a diameter of 2.5 microns or less. So to give you an idea of how small this air pollution is, there's a little diagram here. So a typical um, grain of sand that you would find on the beach is 90 microns. Uh, the human hair um, has a diameter of 50 to 70 microns. Uh, things like dust, pollen, and mold are 10 microns, and then you have PM 2.5 um, at 2.5 microns. And uh, air pollution that falls in this category um, include things like air pollution from fires and um, exhaust from vehicles. So very, very tiny particles of air pollution. And what makes this um, so dangerous to human health is that the small size of these particles allow it to permeate deep within the lungs and get into the bloodstream and then travel around the human body. Um, and once it does that, it causes a lot of other problems um, and inflammation around the body. So it's pretty well known and studied that air pollution um, increases the risk of respiratory diseases. So things like asthma, um, lung disease, COPD, but the impact of air pollution on non-respiratory diseases is not as well known. Um, but there have been studies that have um, you know, indicated some sort of correlation um, to things like high blood pressure, stroke, heart disease, and diabetes. And that's what I wanted to look at. I wanted to look at this relationship between air pollution and diabetes. So um, type two diabetes, um, so diabetes in general is a chronic condition where the pancreas cannot make insulin. Um, there are 37.3 million adults in the US that are diagnosed with diabetes and it's the seventh leading cause of death. Now there are two types of diabetes, type one and type two. For my project, I specifically looked at type two and the reason is because type one is oftentimes genetic whereas type two is linked to environmental and lifestyle factors. Um, so because type one is genetic, we uh, left that one out when just focusing on type two because of that link to the environmental factors. So the study area for the project was the contiguous United States and the data is at the county level. So we're looking at about 3,108 counties all around the United States. And the data that I used for the project, uh, the two main data sources um, are, of course, air pollution and diabetes. Um, both of those came from the CDC. Um, so we have age-adjusted percent of adults age 20 and up with diagnosed diabetes. And then we have the annual average ambient concentrations of PM 2.5 in micrograms per cubic meter. And then additionally, um, I have some other demographic variables that will come into play a little bit later, um, but things like age, ethnicity, um, uh, obesity, median household income, et cetera. Um, and those demographics came mostly from the Census Bureau or the County Health Rankings website. So to get into the methodology of the project, um, the main thing I wanted to do was to model and quantify this relationship between air pollution and diabetes. And I did that with a regression. Um, but before I did that, I went through a couple other steps to understand my data on a spatial level. So we'll go through those steps individually. 
Uh, the first step is I wanted to classify the spatial pattern in the diabetes data. So I said, if I want to come up with some sort of a model for this data, um, is the data, does it have a pattern to it? Is there actually some sort of spatial pattern to the diabetes data that I might potentially be able to model? Um, if not, if diabetes data is completely random, um, then you know there, there wouldn't really, really be much there to model. So I wanted to check first off to see if the diabetes data was in fact, um, if it did present a spatial pattern. So to do this, I used Moran's eye um, and I ran the spatial autocorrelation tool um, in ArcGIS Pro to get this result. So the results of uh, the spatial autocorrelation tool are as follows. Um, it, it gave us an, a Moran's eye value of 0 0.37, indicating that the diabetes data is in fact clustered. Um, so this confirms that there is a spatial pattern to the diabetes data um, and that pattern is uh, clustered. The second step was I wanted to visualize these clusters in the diabetes data. So now that I know that there is a spatial pattern, what is that spatial pattern? Where are these clusters in the United States? So I used the optimized hotspot analysis tool um, to get the Geddes or a GI star statistic. And this shows me where these clusters are in the United States. So the result of that um, can be seen in this map here. So this is a hot spot and cold spot map, um, hot spots indicating areas of high diabetes prevalence and cold spots indicating um, you know, clusters of low diabetes prevalence. So looking at the map here, we see in the southeast region of the United States, um, we have a lot of hot spots, so a clustered area of, of high um, diabetes prevalence. And then the western United States, sort of from the Midwest uh, down through Texas, has cold spots. Um, and this actually confirms what um, previous studies had found, um, that the southeast portion of the United States is referred to as the diabetes belt, um, because it's known to have a high prevalence of diabetes. Um, so it's good to, um, good that uh, these results confirmed that um, and show that there is that high prevalence of diabetes in the southeast region. The third step is that I wanted to detect patterns over time in both the diabetes data and the air pollution data. So the previous map that we looked at was just for one year, but I wanted to see how these patterns, these spatial patterns changed over time. And I wanted to look in both the air pollution data and the diabetes data to see visually if there was some sort of a correlation or overlap between um, one variable increasing and the other variable increasing. So for example, if um, over time air pollution was increasing, did the diabetes data also increase or did the diabetes prevalence also increase? Um, so I used the um, Geddes or a GI star statistic again, but this time with a temporal consideration. So looking at it over time, um, in this uh, I ran with the emerging hotspot analysis tool. So the results of those, um, I have two maps here that I'll flip um, back and forth between so we can see the overlap. The first one here is the diagnosed diabetes data. Um, this was for 2004 to 2018. And the other one was the air pollution um, for the years 2001 to 2016. So we can see in the diabetes data, um, we have in the southeast region of the United States, we have a lot of um, persistent hotspots and intensifying hotspots. Um, so again, clusters of, of high prevalence of diabetes. And then you see again that western portion of the United States, um, not everywhere, but in most areas, we have a lot of those persistent cold spots um, and intensifying cold spots, meaning there's um, you know low prevalence of, of diabetes. If we compare that to the air pollution, um, you can see again the southeast region, we have some areas of um, high air pollution over time, and that western portion of the United States um, has, has lower um, concentrations of, of air pollution. So flipping back and forth between the two, you can see that there is some overlap. So just visually looking at this, we can say, okay, well, there might be some sort of a correlation between these two variables. So now that we've looked at it um, you know, visually um, using the, those statistics, now I wanted to actually get into the modeling of it with some sort of a regression. And I did the regression um, using what's called the random forest algorithm. And there's a tool in Pro called the forest-based classification and regression that helped me to, to run this and produce a model. So without getting uh, too much into um, the details about how the random forest algorithm works, um, I have a little diagram to help explain it and I'll give a, a general overview. Um, so the random forest algorithm is a machine learning algorithm and it creates a number of decision trees. Um, and that's where the name comes from actually, um, the random forest algorithm, you have a bunch of trees, all the trees together create a forest. 
So all of these different decision trees go through um, the explanatory variables and they come up with a, a, some sort of a prediction value. Then all those trees um, basically vote on their prediction value and they take an average. And that's, that's what comes up um, with your final um, result as a prediction value. Now, typically the random forest algorithm is used for predicting, but it can also be used to model. Um, and so I was using it for more of its modeling capabilities. And two reasons why I used uh, the random forest algorithm instead of a regular regression um, is because a random forest algorithm, um, your data does not have to be non-spatially autocorrelated um, and it doesn't have to be non-multicollinear. So when you're doing a typical regression, um, if your data is spatially autocorrelated or multicollinear, that would be a problem. Um, but with a random forest algorithm, you don't have to worry about that, um, which is great because a lot of this um, spatial data has um, you know, spatial autocorrelation and multicollinearity. So we could kind of um, forget about that for the random forest algorithm. And so looking at um, looking back at some of those um, pieces of data that I have that I put in the model. Um, the variable to predict or, or our variable that we were trying to model is the diagnosed diabetes. Um, and then the explanatory variable, the main one was air pollution, but I have the other variables in there um, because those are, are uh, known factors that increase um, your risk of diabetes. So things like obesity, um, median household income, age, et cetera. So with the random forest algorithm, what I wanted to do is I wanted to try to create the best model that would give me the best um, R squared value. Um, and the R squared value would tell me how strong the correlation was. So with the random forest algorithm, I ran 35 different trials uh, with different parameters. And all of these different trials gave me different R squared values. Um, and again, and I was trying to find the combination that would give me the best model, that would give me the highest R squared value. Um, and just a, um, an interesting thing to note here, um, the second column there is the number of trees that were run. Um, so I picked the, the more trees you have, the, the better. Um, and I was actually limited by um, computing power. Um, I uh, chose 125,000. Every one of these took about an hour to run. And I have a pretty powerful computer. Um, and so, you know, I, I could have gone up to, let's say, a million, but it probably would have taken several hours. So I decided to, to cut it off at 125,000. Um, but like that, that image that I showed you to explain the random forest algorithm, um, each time I ran this, there were 125,000 trees that the algorithm would go through and create a value for. Um, so it, um, again, that, that kind of explains why it, why it took so long and why I ended up on the number 125,000. So after these 35 trials, um, the, uh, the R squared value, the highest one that I got was 0 0.597, um, which uh, is, I would classify it as a, a mild to moderate correlation. It's not super strong, um, but it's not weak either. There's something there. Um, so I would classify moderate, uh, moderate to mild. What's also interesting about the random forest algorithm is that it produces this chart of the top 20 variables of importance. So it's saying in your model, which variables um, ha have the most importance. So if we look here, uh, the top six are all obesity, um, which would make sense because obesity is a, a known risk factor for um, diabetes. And we do have two of the air pollution years in here, air pollution for 2010 and air pollution for 2011. Um, so this is interesting. Um, you know, one, it's good that we have air pollution in the top 20 variables. Um, and it's interesting too, that the, the two variables are, that are on here are for the, um, the oldest years that I had. So 2010 and 2011. Um, so this might indicate some sort of a time delay um, between exposure to air pollution and actually um, being diagnosed with diabetes. Um, so, you know, um, maybe it would be um, eight years or, or something like that. So the conclusion of my project um, was that there is a, a moderate correlation between air pollution and diabetes um, across counties in the United States. Um, that strongest correlation can be seen in the southeastern United States. And as mentioned, that air pollution 2010 and 2011 um, had the strongest correlation, um, and that might indicate some sort of a time delay. And then this also confirms previous studies that had looked at this correlation um, in other areas or, or for different years. Um, they all came up with this, um, 
the same sort of conclusion that there's some sort of a, a moderate or mild correlation. Um, so it'd be interesting for, for people in the future to continue this study, um, you know, maybe get more granular health data if they have access to that and, and potentially get a more accurate model. Um, but for, for my project, I, I sort of fell into the, um, the same category as everyone else, can, um, concluding that there is some sort of a moderate correlation between air pollution and diabetes. Um, does anyone have any questions on my project? Well done. That's a lot of work that you did there and, and pulling the resources and running the different models. I'm curious, and I know students that are in the audience that are, maybe they're not at the point yet in designing their capstone projects. How do you go about doing this? What made you, what made you drawn to this particular topic? That's a great question. Um, this was actually a continuation or, or sort of a, a revisit of a project I did in undergrad. Um, I, I have a minor in global health and health policy. And as part of one of my health classes, I did a project on this relationship or the correlation between air pollution and diabetes. And I did a little bit of GIS for it, um, but it was mostly just visualization. It wasn't actual analysis. Um, so when it came time to the capstone, I said, you know, I, I wanna revisit that project because I think this is really intriguing, this relationship between air pollution and diabetes. And I said, this time, I want to go about it um, using GIS. I want to evaluate it uh, on a geospatial perspective. So um, I guess to answer your question, this um, was a project that I had explored previously, um, but now I wanted to go heavy into the GIS part of it. That's great. Um, David has a question and he wants to know if you looked at any, um, are there any standards that exist across those counties that you've been you are looking at uh, based on air filter quality or like changes in building codes as like a factor that you've, you came across? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I didn't go into that aspect, um, but I do um, work for a commercial real estate company. So I, I have a little bit of information on, on you know, LEED certification and all these different um, initiatives for buildings to become more environmentally friendly. Um, so it, it's definitely something that um, cities are, are improving upon. Um, but I guess for, for the purpose of this project, I, I didn't, get, didn't get that granular. Yeah. And air pollution, it's, it's hard because it's not bound to one specific location, the fact that it, you know, crosses counties. So it's, it's a hard uh, component to map and then tie to a specific outcome observation. So yeah. I think you did a terrific job. Congratulations. Thank you for sharing your work. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. So if you go ahead and stop sharing your slides, we're going to take a quick shift over to, we've looked at um, different types of data and how to take that data and come up with uh, answers with our geo intelligence. We looked at how we can create maps for the good of the order uh, for disaster response. Diana just finished a wonderful capstone thesis project showing how we can, you know, come up with a, an answer to a, a big question that we have and how do we run those analysis. So all of these steps have maps involved and the process behind how do you make a good map. And so we are joined by our last presenter tonight, uh, Chris Johnson, who is in the Geo Intelligence Program. Um, Chris is going to share with us his final cartography project from last fall um, that got some accolades and applause at the Esri conference. And he's just going to kind of walk through us through the process of how one goes through designing a map. So, Chris, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. And go ahead and share your slides if you can. There you go. Uh, like Dr. Hansen said, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm in my final year of the Geo Intelligence Program. And I took the cartography course last fall. Um, and with Dr. Hansen's encouragement, um, she helped me, encourage me to, to keep working on my final map and improve it so that I could submit it to the Esri User Conference. So um, I'm going to take you through a few of the different iterations I went through from the final version to the Esri Map Conference version. Um, I have I had six months in between to <laughs> to make changes, which was a blessing and a curse. Um, it was almost too much time because there's always something to improve on a map. Um, so I'll take you through some of the major changes I made, um, kind of my thought process and what I think about the final version compared to the first version. Um, so what you're looking at now is not not my map. This is from the National Park Service. Um, and this, I wanted to show this first because it's kind of was my inspiration for the topic um, and ended up being my only data source. So a lot of times with, with cartography or GIS in general, it's really nice to find a shapefile of the data you need. 
Um, once I decided on my topic of mapping wolf pack population change in Denali National Park, this was the best data that I could, that I could find. Um, and it was just a PDF published by the National Park Service. Um, and I found it for, this is for 2021, and I found basically the identical thing for 2020. So my challenge was to try to recreate this map, but to show two years on, on one map with a certain type of symbology um, and to make some improvements on, on this. Um, I didn't like that you had to look back and forth so much from the legend to the map itself to, to understand how, how big the pack was and only seeing one year at a time doesn't tell you much about the growth. So this is what I started with. Um, and I basically made my own table out of the data from the two PDFs um, so that I could use the table to feature class tool in ArcGIS Pro. So this is the map that I turned in for my cartography final. Um, I was really happy with it at the time. When I turned it in, I was proud of it, um, and I still am. But looking back now, uh, there are some really obvious improvements that I could make. So for each version, I'm just going to talk about a few, um, <laughs> even though there are a lot more, believe me, and a lot more versions that I'm going to show you. Um, so the main thing, just looking at it now, is that it's too busy. The, the two things that I wanted to represent obviously were the change in the wolf pack population, and I wanted to show the elevation of the park. Um, I didn't know if there would be any correlation between where the, the packs were growing or shrinking, um, but that was something I wanted to include, and I really just wanted to try my hand at uh, hill shade technique. So I came up with, after creating the feature class in Arc ArcGIS Pro, uh, I determined that I would need basically five symbols. So solid green represents a totally new pack, a pack that showed up in 2021, but was not there in 2020. Uh, the symbol to show pack growth, the inner circle would be the, the size of the pack in 2020. And then the outer ring would show how many wolves were added in 2021. Black is no change. And then pack loss, the, the inner circle would be the 2021 population size and the red would represent how many wolves were lost from that pack. And then with the dashed line and solid red would represent total loss. So with my first version, obviously, like I said, it's just two, there's a lot going on. Um, <laughs> if I only wanted to represent the population change and the elevation, I didn't need to have so much in terms of the map elements um, because your eye isn't really drawn to one place, um, I don't think. In addition to that, um, my choice of green and red was the most obvious to represent growth and loss. But if you're taking the cartography course now, you will you will learn if you haven't already that you should consider colorblind friendly maps and colors. Um, so I failed at that. And then the blue hillshade, this was my first attempt ever making a custom hillshade. Um, I think I took 11 digital elevation models, merged them together and then clipped them to the park boundary. Um, and my thought process was I needed contract. I also was dead set on using blurred satellite imagery as the background. I thought it looked cool, um, but to achieve contrast from that, I had to choose, a, I thought, a bold color. Um, so it's supposed to look like glaciers, but I think Dr. Hansen's first feedback was that it's not really representative of what the terrain really looks like there. So that was one of my first challenges. And then text issues will be a theme <laughs> in every version, but um, I had trouble getting text to stand out on this hill shade because it goes from so dark in some places to light in others, and there was never a simple solution. So I ended up just going way overboard with like bolding and 3D uh, drop shadows. So I didn't think that the fonts, all of the fonts that I used were cohesive. And then I was doing weird things like this that were just unnecessary. So that was my starting point. So my next version was an attempt to get more realistic hillshade terrain. Um, I still wasn't really very experienced with different hillshades. Um, I eventually found a John Nelson, who is an Esri employee. If you're in car the cartography class, definitely recommend checking him out. And I'll put the link to the tutorial that I used uh, to get a little better at hillshades. Um, so this was my first attempt, but I had issues with it uh, to where it came out almost looking flat. I still didn't really know what I was doing. Um, 
it took a lot of experimenting with hill shades, which I like to do, so it was fun, but it, it was really time consuming as well. Um, and every time I changed the hill shade, I would have to change something about the text to make it stand out on a different color. Um, so I still am not really happy with especially how these the glacier text looks. Um, it's difficult to get them all to fit in there in the first place. But again, I went with a really heavy stroke to try to get it to stand out on white and on brown. Um, the, the set of text of fonts is still not very cohesive. Um, but what I did correct was the colorblind issue. Um, I actually found a really cool resource on the internet that has a color colorblind friendly chart where you can get basically the colorblind friendly correlate to green or red. Um, and it came up with purple and orange, which I was worried about, but actually I think it's still, I think it really works. Um, it's still somewhat negative connotation for orange and purple can be seen as positive. So I fixed that. Um, and then this is where I really started to notice that there were so many unnecessary elements that, that was cluttering the map. Um, so that was my next goal. And I think with this next version will be the biggest, most notable, noticeable change um, in the overall feel of the map. So this is when I, I must have gone through, I don't know how many different versions of Hillshades, but uh, I figured out how to blend, used ArcGIS Pro's uh, blend feature, which I think was pretty new when I was starting to do this. Um, and you can, so you can pull the background imagery through to different, to varying degrees. Whereas on the last version, it was, I think, too heavily reliant on the imagery. I experimented with, in ArcGIS Pro, moving the imagery in between my hillshade layers. Um, I think I have three hillshades, three slopes, and hillshades that I created off of slopes based on John Nelson's tutorial that gives it a little more um, dimension. So this is when I started to become a little bit happier with it. I also I removed the satellite imagery as the background, and I until I did this, I didn't really realize how how much that was affecting the map overall. Um, so at this point, I felt that the overall tone of the map had improved. Um, I had limited the information to only what was really relevant. I had the the scale bar on the side over here, which basically created the same problem that I complained about on the national parks map that you. You kind of have to, if you look at the bear paw size, you have to somehow look over here and figure out what number that is, and you, you just can't. So I got rid of that and instead just put the current pack size in the center of the symbol. So it's all right there in addition to how many it gained or lost. So at this point, I, I was only going to make small changes and cleaning it up to this extent. I also changed the layout. Um, Dr. Hanselman will tell you again, if you're in cartography, you don't need a box for every element of the map. Um, so I remembered that and I just wanted to make something subtle that blended in with the texture of the background. Um, and then this is the final version that I submitted to the Esri user conference. And the biggest change from the last version is that I really wanted to try to incorporate the ranges of the packs, um, but all along I had been worried that it would make the map too busy. And I realize now it's because it was already so busy. Um, so by cleaning it up in other ways, it allows for, for adding more information that I think is useful to the subject of the map, um, but doesn't over clutter it. Um, so some, some issues, if I could still critique my final version, um, by removing the satellite imagery background, some of these um, symbols go outside of the, the area of interest, which kind of bothers me. Having, you know, information, geographic information over an area with no geographic context. So I would criticize myself for that. Um, but I definitely got better at the, the fonts, I think, are cleaner. And then my last self-criticism would be, um, in my text box, the correlation that I kind of obser observed or hypothesized was that possibly doing to, due to melting permafrost that wolf packs were moving to areas of higher elevation. Um, and I think it's a weak correlation, but it's at least something to think about while you look at the map. 
um, as the, there are two whole new packs of 10 and 9 in areas of higher elevation. Um, but then again, there's still a large pack in an area with not much elevation. So that is it. Um, it was a lot of fun. I definitely would recommend anyone in the cartography course to submit their final map or any map to the Ezra user conference. It's a really easy process, and the worst they can say is no. Thank you. Oh, that, that was terrific, Chris. Thank you so much for sharing that with the group. And um, David commented, he said, wow, you really don't notice how the imagery in the background is impacted until you actually remove it, and it really makes everything pop. So thank you for sharing that. And also, yeah. I think it, it just goes to show, you know, when you take a moment and, and if you have the time to reflect and work with maps, you can really see the improvement. So I just really appreciate you sharing that process with us. Nice job. Thank you for having me. Well, and so your maps, you have two maps that are in the running for perhaps to be featured in the Esri map book. So who knows, fingers crossed, best of luck to you. And, and maybe we'll see these maps in, in next year's um, Esri map book. Thank you. Excellent. All right, um, let's see. Let me just check and make sure that everyone's saying congratulations, beautiful map. So thank you so much for sharing. So this brings us to the end of um, GIS After Dark. And I just want to say thank you so much for the presenters uh, tonight. Really just show the extent of the work that our students are, are producing. And, and thank you all for being here tonight. So just let's go ahead and give another virtual round of applause to the presenters. Thank you, folks, for being here. And um, you know, please stay in touch. Uh, we have our private um, Hopkins GIS LinkedIn group. If you're not a member, please be so. Please join. Um, and just to give you a heads up, our next GIS After Dark session is going to be November 10th. So we are going to be welcoming an International GIS Day and uh, honoring Geospatial Awareness Week with Hopkins' very own Frank Gong, who uh, was the integral member of creating the, the Hopkins COVID dashboard. So we're excited to hear from him and he's going to talk with us and kind of reflect on since the, you know, since the concept of the dashboard to looking back on it years later and share with us lessons learned. So again, I just wanna thank everyone for being here tonight and presenters, thank you again. And that's the end. So have a great evening and have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everyone.